Thank you so much for that introduction. Hello, everybody. As you might have gleaned from that introduction, I've spent over 10 years as a designer. I began my career as a designer as a student in Mumbai at the NMIMS School of Architecture. From there, I had the privilege of working with my mentor in a boutique interior and architecture design firm. Soon I realized that my interests might be differing from what I'm doing. So I ended up taking a leap into Harvard as an urban designer. I added on a second degree, and now I find myself practicing as an urban designer at the firm named Sasaki, which looks to transform urban lives everywhere. However, when I had give, was given this opportunity to use this platform to spread something, I thought, why not talk about 10 things I learned as a designer I wish everyone knew. So even though my voice is a little sore, I'm going to try and get through all 10. Let's jump right in. The first thing that I learned as a designer that I wish everybody knew is how you think matters. Emphasis on how. The process matters. As a designer, you learn very early on that there is no single right solution. There are multiple approaches to a single problem. This means that when you walk into a design studio on the first day, your professor is going to give 80 students a single design problem. At the end of the semester, you will see 80 different problems, 80 different solutions to a single problem. Each of them are slightly different, yet similar. What this taught me is that it's not about which path you choose to create a solution. It's about how you argue for that solution. Deepak Malhotra, one of my favorite professors from the Harvard Business School, once said, people in this world are not looking for other people who have the right answers. What they're looking for is for people who can make compelling arguments. Today I ask you, can you, do you focus on making compelling arguments? Do you focus on the process that you're using to think? In addition to learning that there's no single approach to right answers, I also learned that design and life are both iterative processes. As designers, we learn very early on not to say no to ourselves. How many of you in this audience today have stopped yourself from expressing an idea, putting down something on paper, asking a question because you didn't think it was perfect? I'd, I'd bet that most of us over here have stopped ourselves from doing this. One of my closest professors once told me, Perfection is the enemy of the good. I think what he was also trying to say was that perfection is the enemy of creativity. As designers, we're, learned, we're taught to commit to ideas. What is in your head is not actually reality. We're taught to iterate. When you walk through a design studio, you'll see numerous models on people's desks. Some of them look similar to the one before them. Some of them absolutely different. Why this process matters is because it's not just a waste of time. It allows you to glean what information is failing and what is succeeding. All of that is then amalgamated into a proper design solution. Today, I ask you to start looking at your life as an iterative process, which has multiple approaches towards success. The second point I'd like to talk about is engaging with chaos. When we do away with this illusion of perfection, we'll start to see the world as it really is. It's a complex system. It is messy. In a world where we're so used to getting information in tiny, bite-sized pieces which are meant for consumption, as a designer, I have learned that in reality, the world is just simply complex. We have a saying in design sometimes, in the soup. When you're in the soup, you're sitting within that chaos. You're marinating in it almost. What we taught is to sit in it rather than run away from it. The more time you spend with all of the complexities, the more you'll realize that what often looks like that will soon begin to look like that. I remember when I was doing my design dissertation in my fifth year of architecture, my mentor Priyank Mehta told me, only from chaos can there be order. He was quoting Nietzsche, from chaos comes order. What these two men are trying to tell us is that if we want to reorder the world, if we want to evolve, rather than taking the simplistic path, we need to move beyond what you see as the tidy, facile world. The next point, then, is about the world. There is so much information in the world. There is so much knowledge production. When you don't have a set curriculum with a prescribed textbook, what design teaches you to do, then, is to focus on how you see the world, how you learn to know it. That, I think, is instrumental and important for everybody here today. It sounds easy, right? Hey, no textbooks. You don't have to write an examination. But what it forces you to do for information is to go out. It forces you to gather information, to assimilate information, to analyze information, and then to redeploy information. In this process, we often forget to ask, 
what are the sources that we're drawing upon? Citations become an afterthought, meant to be done at the end of a project. But why? I've had the privilege of learning with Professor Abby Spinnack, and she once told me, citations and knowledge production are both politics. Who you choose to quote and who you choose to learn from are very important choices, especially when you're not given a set prescribed textbook. I, I want to stand here today and thank Abby for teaching me how to think, but also for giving me the ability to make this presentation this way. If then we start questioning what sources we are drawing upon to make design interventions or solutions for ourselves, we'll also realize that what we need to begin doing is di diversifying our perspective, diversifying the sources we are engaging with. There are so many contradicting opinions in the world. If you're only looking at the ones that agree with your perspective, you're not going to be able to grow. That is why I say what we consider information is important. Let me make a simple case. When you look at a cone, somebody might say they're seeing a circle. Someone else might say they're seeing a triangle. Neither of them are incorrect. They're just looking at it from different standpoints. We learn this very early in design. Perspective and perspective taking is important to understanding how you can respond to problems, how you can respond to challenges. I'm going to argue that not only is perspective taking important, but it's also important to question what we consider knowledge. I can say that my Harvard experience was shaped by the people that were sitting to my left, my right. Most of the people that I've quoted today, my professors, those were conversations I had with them over coffee. Codified knowledge is not the only form of knowledge. As designers, we're forced to go on the site to talk to people, to listen to what they're saying, but especially to what they're not saying. Silence is also data. Once we start looking at underlying information and knowledge, we'll be able to make more robust solutions. This is why I say diversify your perspective. Go beyond those books. Go to libraries, go out, go watch movies. It will enrich the way you start approaching different things. If you're OK with taking into consideration so many diverse perspectives, you'll also realize that the world does not work in binaries. Right and wrong, black and white, were mental frameworks that were given to us to make this complex world simpler. Like I said, the world is messy. But these frameworks are far too reductive and simplistic to be using even today. It's not about making qualitative judgments about things. I think what's more important is to recognize the differences that we're dealing with today. The main goal, I think, in design is to negotiate contradicting opinions and find creative ways to make them work together. I think that's pretty much life as well. If you stop looking at things that don't agree with you, if you think something is right and look away from it, it doesn't make it go away. So stop trying to make qualitative judgments. Instead, try to expand your worldview. And how we do this, how we deal with all of this information that I'm telling you to kind of assimilate, to work with, to allow into your space, is through our own internal moral compass. If you do away with this idea of binaries, I'm also asking you to do away with this need to be put in a box by other people's opinions, by other people's perspectives. You heard my resume a little bit earlier. I call myself an urban designer planner. I call myself an urban strategist. I call myself a systems thinker. Oftentimes, there's no job descriptions that look like that. People are too busy wanting you to fit into a certain perspective. You're left, you're right, you believe in certain things, you don't believe in certain things. That's what starts limiting us. Design taught me that if I have a moral internal compass based on everything that I have gleaned, I'm not only al allowed to break away from that box, I oftentimes expand it. I expand other people's perspectives with it too. So I ask you to stop letting them tell you what you are. In an extremely over-specialized world, I have learned that we need more specialized generalists. That's what I've begun defining myself as. Designers are in extreme demand today as people who can bridge the gaps between people who are only used to their own perspective. This brings me to my next question, my next lesson, which is frame intentional questions. When you're taking on so much altogether, everything boils, boils down to how you define the challenge that you want to take on. Words matter. I'm not saying there is right and wrong questions. Trust me, there isn't. Ask lots of questions. But are you being intentional about what you're asking? Are you thinking about the way you're framing it? How you frame it will define what response you get. Under thought out questions will always get underwhelming responses. 
If you're asking questions that have been asked before, you're going to be chasing your tail or coming back with the same solutions. Don't do it. Think about questions that you would ask that are challenging but are still well-framed and then can, can inform your modus operandi, which is how do you respond to it. A well-framed question will then allow you to engage with two very important design concepts that I'd like to present before you today. One is scope out scale. You have this huge problem that you've already started researching about. You've then zoomed into a small question that you'd like to answer. However, oftentimes we forget to position ourselves with respect to that question. Scale is about sphere of influence and sphere of concern. One of my very close mentors, Rahul Mirotra, was very worried one day when I was trying to take on the problems of the entire world as an urban designer. And so he asked me, Ishna, have you considered your sphere of concern and your sphere of influence? His simple statement helped me understand that what he's asking is what is my true agency given the position that I currently occupy? I'm a big adv advocate for a systems thinking approach, which means to look at the world with all its holes and relationships rather than splitting it into its parts. But I'm also a big advocate for positioning yourself within that system and asking, can you do what you want from where you are currently standing? As an urban designer, I cannot make policy changes. I would have to make a move for that. That is why every day in our lives, I think we should think about scale. Scale is a more tangible thing to wor work with, though. What is intangible is time, even though it is one of the most important things. As designers, we often emphasize the importance of time, both in terms of time horizons and in terms of time periods. As children, we were often taught to draw a straight line as a timeline, with exact constant intervals and looking like time worked in a single linear fashion. However, design taught me that line, time is not linear. Time is cyclical. Oftentimes, what we see in the past comes back. Time gets compressed based on innovation and technology, and sometimes it expands as well. What we then need to be OK with is to create correct checkpoints along the way. I ask, when you start thinking about solutions, when you pl start planning your life, do you think about the time constraints you have within which you're working? Do you think about the time periods within which you should look back again and see if your plan's working? Design makes you do that. As an urban designer, if I start designing something, I know that in 10 years, the world will not be the same. And so I create a checkpoint for it. Today and every day in life, I'm asking you to think about time with time and through time. Not linearly, but oftentimes cyclically. Look at your past and rethink what you're looking for in the future. This will ensure that you go towards success. And that brings me to the question of how important it is to define your metrics for measuring success. Just like there's no single straight answer or a single solution, success doesn't look similar to everybody. What might be success for somebody sitting there is making a great painting. For you, it might be making a lot of money. For me, it might be looking healthy. All of these things are success in their own right. But why is it important to measure success? It's because that gives you a feedback loop. It allows you to check that your intervention is actually working. If you're looking at the wrong metrics, you're probably going to keep making wrong changes. And that's not going to help you get closer to success. So at the end of the day, if you define your metrics correctly at the correct dimensions, you'll probably make proper changes which allow you to get closer to success. I'm a designer, and we love setting out rules for ourselves. But more often than not, we also break them ourselves. That's because we want to be different. So I said I'd give you 10 takeaways, but today I'll leave you with an 11th. And for me, what design taught me is that we are every bit our aspirations for ourselves. What this means is that as designers, we're taught to be hopeless believers, not to be overwhelmed by the chaos that we welcome in, because we're given the tools to work through it. I was sitting at the Harvard Graduate School of Design in the Piper Auditorium when one of the greatest design thinkers, Rem Kulas, said, design without utopian ambition is a degraded profession. It really stood out to me. I still work with it every day. All I'm asking is that you continue to believe that even when things get tough, you have the ability to work through it. Sit in the soup with the tension, and you will start seeing the solutions. I'm telling you, I've lived dreams I didn't know I had for myself. I got opportunities I never dreamt of. And this was not all planned out. Trust me, with COVID and other things, all of my plans were thrown out of the window. But I started thinking like a designer. 
I took multiple different approaches. I tried things and failed as well. But today I stand here before you because I continue to believe, believe in the hopeless optimism of design. That is why, as I leave you today, I'm going to leave you with a few other thoughts. Your thoughts matter. They may not be correct or incorrect. You may not feel like you know enough. You may think that you have incomplete information or that there's too much more to learn and so you shouldn't express your thoughts. But I'm going to tell you that even though I grapple with all of these issues, your thoughts matter. People value you for your thoughts. So long as you're working on your thought process, it's okay to be incorrect. Just go ahead and say what you're thinking anyway. You do not go it alone. I am standing here because of all the people that have nurtured me, supported me, mentored me, and taught me. I do not take that lightly. From the driver that drove me at 2 a.m. to get a laser cutting piece from a workshop, to the friend that brewed coffee for me at 2 a.m. Value those connections. Listen to those people around you. Nurture them and never be extractive with them. And third, and form, third but not last, get uncomfortable. When I left for Harvard University, I'd never actually left my house for a long period of time. When I reached there, my mother kept asking me, are you doing OK? Every time there was a problem, she was like, can I help you? And the one response I kept giving her is, I'll figure it out. After seeing me three years in flying colors later, she's been imploring me to write a book that says, I'll figure it out. And I told her, I'm not writing that book yet, because this cannot be the zenith of where I reach. Someday, maybe I'll do it. But what I will leave you with today is that you should get uncomfortable. Because if you remember to think like a designer, I promise you, I assure you, you too will figure it out. Not alone, with a little bit of help from everyone around you. Thank you.